May God bless you and welcome to another episode of Living in Mouse, a serialized program on the Holy Eucharist presented by Verbum TV, the only Catholic TV station broadcasting here in Sri Lanka and overseas in order to enhance the Catholic faithful with their spiritual life. And so, in this serious series of programs on the Holy Eucharist, we hope to enlighten you viewers on a living experience of the Holy Eucharist. That is why we call it Living a Mouse. Living a Mouse, as you know, is about or is based on the experience of the two disciples on their way to a mouse, where the Lord enlightened them with the word of God, the Holy Scriptures, and they recognized the Lord in the breaking of bread. When their hearts were burning, they realized the presence of the risen Lord amidst them. So we hope that you will have a similar experience at every Holy Eucharist that you celebrate by understanding more deeply the spiritual, the theological, various aspects of the Holy Eucharist we celebrate. And of course, in order to uh, do so, we have with us an erudite liturgist as our source, as our source person, and that is none other than Reverend Father Cecil Joy Pereira. He is the director of uh, Daham Sevena Seminary in Kalutara and has been the former uh, Archdiocesan Liturgi liturgical director or the director of the liturgical apostolate in the Archdiocese. So welcome Father Cecil Joy once again to Living a Mouse. Thank you Trevor. In our previous uh, episodes dear viewers, we were discussing the liturgy of the word uh, which is one of the most important parts of the Mass, the Holy Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And we did uh, discuss the structure, we did discuss the theology and the history of the Word of God, the liturgy of the Word, and we came up to the point where we were talking about the acclamation, the gospel acclamation. So uh, we couldn't do that justice uh, last time, Father. Uh, so shall we start from there and I, I would ask you, what, what is the significance of the gospel acclamation just before the proclamation of the gospel? Yes, Trevor, thank you very much. But just before that, I would like to thank many of our viewers for personally contacting me after these programs, after watching these programs from their homes and uh, encouraging us, thanking us and also asking many other questions uh, off the camera, uh, which I think is a very good thing because they seem to really now understand Actually, we do not know very much about the Mass, right? Uh, some of them uh, keep telling me, Father, it's only now that we realize that yeah. our Mass is very precious right. and it has so much of value and meaning, hidden depths, the mystery element of it. So I'm very grateful to all of you, dear weavers, for the comments we receive. And uh, hopefully you will uh, not only just watch these programs, but you will try to internalize all these and then make uh, this a living experience as Trevor rightly explained about the Emmaus story. Now, uh, coming to the question about the gospel acclamation, I think uh, we couldn't do justice to that. We must, I think, all over uh, begin a kind of an explanation about what this acclamation is all about. It's a kind of a preparation for the arrival of the Lord. Right. If you say that's, the, that's like the arrival of the chief guest in an auditorium, there are, you know, the others who arrive, there are also very distinguished personalities coming yeah. and people keep watching and they say, ah, that's so and so, that's so and so. Mm. But when the, when the chief guest arrives, the whole scenario changes. Yeah. The whole scenario changes. Then you hear the ceremonial beating of the drums and then the, all the excitement, the camera crew running here and there. And then yeah. you know that you know, yes. uh, the chief uh, guest has arrived. And yeah. we naturally, spontaneously, we all get up. And there is a round of applause also sometimes. And there may right. be a, a welcome song, right? All very ceremonial. 
to welcome the chief guest. Now, this is maybe, you know, it's, it may not be the best of comparisons, but it's a kind of a very uh, ordinary way of uh, imagining the arrival of the chief guest, the master, the Lord and master who now wants to speak his own word wants to show us how the law and the prophets and the psalms and the wisdom literatures are fulfilled in him. That's where the arrival of the chief guest is very important. So the acclamation yeah. is to acclaim the Messiah who arrives. And right. it's a very joyful acclamation. Yeah. Right? That's why we burst into hallelujah. Hallelujah, we praise God because God has been preparing the way for a long time and here the Messiah arrives. And in the here and now, in our parish church, in our community, the Lord is arriving in the personality of the deacon here, in the personality of a priest or a bishop or the, or the pope for that matter. He is arriving to proclaim his word. So it's a very joyful moment. It's a moment of great victory and triumph. Because, you know, in some cases, people are still waiting for the Messiah. So the Messiah arrives and therefore it's a joyful acclamation. How we do that in the Roman rite, we have our own way of doing that, right? Mm -hmm. For example, we all get up, right? Yeah. Spontaneous as if, you know, the arrival of the chief guest. Then uh, the bursting into song with the hallelujah. That's why hallelujah must be sung. Right. In, in certain uh, instances, it's very disheartening. Father, can I interrupt you and ask me? Yes. Just that word, Alleluia also, what does it actually mean, the word Alleluia? Is Halle it an English word? It's not. No, no, no it comes yeah. from Hebrew, Halleluia, Halleluia, that is so praise it's God. Word. Yeah, it's praise God, praise, praise God. God. Halleluia, yeah. praise God. Uh, it's basically, uh, you know, in the, in the Old Testament, and then since the, you asked me this question, you know, curiously, um, in the New Testament, it's found only in one place. Oh, really? <laughs> right. <laughs> only in the book of Revelation, chapter 19. Yes, yes. I right. Know, yes. In the Gospels, you don't find yeah. the word Alleluia. No, you don't. You don't find, and then even in the, the epistles, you don't find the word Alleluia. It's at the final victory. Right. Now, final victory in the book of Revelation, book of Revelation. right? We are, everyone now bursts into song, the song of victory, the song of joy, right? And, and then to say that, okay, now it is accomplished, it's, it's accomplished. So, we burst into this very joyful uh, singing of hallelujah with a versicle which goes thematically hand in hand with the gospel. If you see, there is right. a versicle, right? And these must be sung. And uh, the general instructions to the Roman Missal tells us very clearly, it must be sung or it must be dropped. Right? See, it is either or. So and it's a very... choice there, I must say. No, no choice. It's, it's important. So it yeah. shows the significance of that. It, it shows the significance. It, it should be dropped. Yeah, it, it is. It is it's a kind of a, uh, you know, farce, a, a derogatory thing too. Just read it out. Right. Right. Ha have you ever seen a chief guest arriving and then uh, uh, maybe a baby of girls getting on the stage and just reciting a poem? No. They yes. would also sing, no, joyfully. True. Right. Yes. So, so it's, it's a kind of an anticlimax that you invite a very distinguished personality. Yes. And do something so simplistic. I mean, you can't you can't tolerate that, no? That's why it must be sung. It must be sung. At least let's say, let's say I mean, even even on a weekday that can be yeah. sung. That can be sung. Yes. Uh, then on Sundays and solemnities, it must be sung. And very joyfully sung. Mm -hmm. Very triumphantly sung. Even the versicle. Now yeah. I hear many in many places they sing. Uh, the Alleluia, but somebody comes and just rattles off the versicle without chanting. You know, that must be chanted and that's the duty of the cantors, mm -hmm. right? And, and it is not the duty of the one who proclaims the gospel in many cases. I mean, however much we say, the, the, the readers and the cantors walk away back to their own uh, seats, leaving 
the poor celebrant to read out or chant the versical which is not right it's mm. as if i am singing my own welcome, welcome song, song. <laughs> i know how ridiculous no yeah. it's ridiculous are you are you ever going to have that kind of thing yeah. the chief guest uh, singing his own welcome song yeah that's why the celebrants must not chant or must not read out now it has happened to me many times being the chief celebrant in uh, some of these masses and uh, they sing the hallelujah and then expect me to chant or read out the versicle mm -hmm. i don't i simply forget about them and start with the with the with the, <laughs> with the gospel, gospel yeah. as if i am in a, in other words i am telling them okay you sang the chorus right it's it, it's enough for me i am not going to sing the verses for my own self yeah right how am i going to do that i think it's a la lack of understanding yeah it's a lack of understanding so think, about the roles yeah. about the ministries you know right. now we must talk about these ministries within the liturgy of the word yeah. there are many ministries not only the lector not mm -hmm. only the cantor we have the psalmist right yeah. we have the psalmist psalmist is for the responsorial psalm, psalm. so you have the lector for the first reading and the second reading you have the cantor especially for the gospel acclamation these are diverse roles played by different lay people at different stages of the development of the liturgy of the word which we referred to in our in our previous episode and the exactly. quoting pope paul the 6th uh, encyclical ministeria quaedam exactly. ministeria quaedam yes. very clearly says how these different roles must be must be upheld that's right. and that's where the active participation of the lay people uh, comes to play mm. comes into play otherwise only one person now not that they are incapable no the same person who read the first reading can surely read the second reading it's not that it's not about your 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 uh, incapability or uh, your weakness in reading that makes someone else comes to the podium to read no mm. that's not the idea. the idea is the ministerial celebration of the liturgy of the word right. the ministerial celebration that you are recognized as a special minister even to read out one line so right. it's very important so it must be sung joyfully sung triumphantly sung the versicle must be chanted then only the gospel acclamation is completed yeah now there are many practical issues around this gospel acclamation now many people keep asking what about lent i'm sure you have yes i was lent. going to ask that as to why we don't have the uh, hallelujah gospel acclamation as it were uh, during the season of lent and uh, why only during the ordinary season and uh, only a verse saying glory glory and praise to you lord jesus christ during uh, lent. lent yes which is most of the time again not sung but just recited sometimes yes now see the word gospel acclamation refers to the acclamation before the gospel and we shouldn't call it hallelujah no it's not hallelujah now this is our problem yeah. we says you sing hallelujah no 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 it's using the gospel, gospel acclamation right with the relevant versicle so using the gospel acclamation alleluia except during lent is the normal easter way of celebrating that because because alleluia is a word technical word especially akin with easter the resurrection hallelujah when when the lord rises from the dead hallelujah the lord is risen mm -hmm. right st augustine uh, says no uh, we are an easter people and alleluia is our song so yeah. says st augustine right we are an easter people to remind us that we are an easter people except during lent because that's a time period pre of preparation for easter in uh, the rest of the time during the liturgical year we sing alleluia because we are an easter people yeah. and alleluia is our song okay. right that's why alleluia is very profusely used hmm. but it doesn't mean that during lent the gospel acclamation is dropped it's a wrong understanding so there hmm. is the gospel acclamation which must be sung so you can't say because it's lent Uh, there is a sober somber mood therefore we don't sing that that's uh, actually not no. at all not at all uh, accepted so we sing the acclamation 
the joyful triumphant acclamation as it right. is right praise and honor to you lord jesus christ yeah. we are welcoming uh, the one who is going to proclaim uh, the gospel the words of salvation so it must also be sung right because uh, during lent we don't use the word alleluia until easter saturday night right. which is a kind of a bursting into that uh, song of victory mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's a kind of a real you know after hibernation after a period of silence mm -hmm. lying low right because we have been very patiently preparing ourselves and suddenly you have the bursting of uh, the alleluia as a song of triumph yeah. so uh, this gospel acclamation therefore must be taken very seriously and we must also note that the versicle is always connected to the gospel itself sometimes a quotation uh, words from the exactly. gospel itself exactly exactly sometimes yeah. it repeats a line from, from the, gospel, the gospel yeah right mm. which means now prepare for this prepare mm. for this so th this has to be taken very seriously sometimes we think you know because they are short because they are very brief they are not important certainly no in that case amen is the the, the the shortest of acclamations but how important is that amen amen is a very important yeah. accla acclamation therefore we don't go by the length of the you know word or the phrase or the sentence no we go by the theological importance of what we are doing right so therefore the gospel acclamation must be sung joyfully sung triumphantly sung sung by a cantor not by any other minister not by the deacon not by the priest not by the bishop now supposing our cantors go away we as ministers ordained ministers must not be doing that yeah then in that case we can straight away start with the gospel right right to tell them okay look here you are making the mistake i am not going to read this I'm not going to read this. This is yeah. not my job. It's your job as the cantor. Yeah. Okay. On the other hand, Father, if the gospel acclamation is sung, there is also an accompanying procession. You can touch yes. upon that. And yes. therefore, there is no room for the celebrant there to come in because yes, he has exactly. another job. Exactly. Now, along with the gospel acclamation, there is, or at least on Sundays and solemnities, there must be the gospel procession. Right. Right. Now you remember in the entrance procession we brought the book of gospels held yeah. high, right, mm -hmm. very solemnly in the entrance procession yes. representing Christ himself. And then where do we place that? On the altar, not on the ambo. Mm -hmm. Right? On the altar we place that. And then because altar is Christ, right? Then from the altar to the ambo it's not a long distance it's a very short distance but we have a very small procession but a very important procession reminding us that it is the messiah who now enters the messiah enters as if he tri just as he triumphantly entered into the city of jerusalem he enters yeah. and then this is the meaning of the procession so the procession uh, comprises uh, the 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 turifa mm -hmm. uh, uh, flanked by the candle bearers and then the, the deacon carrying uh, the book of gospels aloft right. and they go from uh, the altar to the lectern to the ambo that's yeah. the gospel procession and it is during that time the uh, gospel acclamation is sung mm -hmm. so it's an accompaniment also to this gospel procession right. unfortunately in many of our parishes this doesn't happen yeah it's not a difficult thing to do but of course first you have to acquire a book of gospels yeah. right of course we will come to talk about the different books that we are using uh, after yeah. we finish the structure yeah. each parish must have a book of gospels for the entrance procession we bring the book of gospels for this uh, procession with the book of gospels to the ambo we use the book of gospels we don't use the bible we don't use the lectionary we don't use any other thing like the missal or the sacramentary we use the book of gospels so it's very important that all parishes must have a book of gospels and then we carry the book of gospels very solemnly 
and uh, to the ambo then only the gospel proclamation begins yes okay so that's uh, a good explanation about the uh, gospel acclamation gospel i think acclamation, we have covered yes. it much better than we did last time yes of course uh, but yeah. i'd like to also refer to another point that we discussed last uh, episode father that is about the sequence which uh, happens uh, or is uh, used for very special solemn occasions or solemn uh, solemnities can you uh, tell us uh, about the sequence yeah. now this is not very common to our people because we don't do it in sri lanka unfortunately yeah. right and uh, sequence what's that what's that we what's the sequence father we Never don't see it as it. part of the structure <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, it, it is there yes. it is there if you if you go to uh, the easter sunday mass yeah and the pentecost yeah. sunday mass uh before the hallelujah before the acclamation there is a sequence and you want now what is this now what do we do that every now and then we find a lecture coming and father father what about this what ah forget yes. about it forget about it don't don't, don't yeah. worry about it just glide Mostly over that is left out. because people don't know what it is yeah. even if you sing that people would sing oh, okay now what's the meaning of this whole blessed thing right. they never heard of a sequence yeah it's good for us to maybe also give a brief explanation uh, to this word sequence because at least on two occasions now it is there it is compulsory now the two occasions are easter sunday mass yes. and then we have the pentecost sunday mass right two right uh, on easter sunday there is a sequence called victime pascali of course mm -hmm. the english version is there then uh, then on pentecost sunday we have the veni sancti spiritus right now what is this it's a little bit of history must be brought in here you know by the 9th century travel in the history of the roman liturgy uh, especially after the discovery or maybe even 10th century discovery of the music notation mm -hmm. by guido of arezzo chanting became very important right. very important element within the liturgy of the word and uh, reminded of the gregorian chants and so on is of that course, uh, yes. before that is it yeah gregorian <laughs> chant uh, we'll, we can discuss that maybe <laughs> in another oh, yeah. not one maybe one whole episode okay <laughs> yeah maybe maybe one day we will discuss yeah. gregorian chant as well so what happened was they used chants especially in uh, the monasteries the benedictine yeah. monasteries were mm -hmm. very well known for this uh, to meditate on the word of god so chants were introduced intermittently here and there so that there is prolongation okay. on the words that were read and then there is more time more contemplative time and space for them to meditate on what they have heard right. and read mm -hmm. right so what happened was um, uh, especially around the 9th century there was a very well known benedictine monk called notker notker of balbulus right don't worry about these names, names yeah. let's say it's a benedictine monk this benedictine monk is well known for composing these sequences mm -hmm. so uh, let's say we have the gospel acclamation with the alleluia which had several verses yeah several verses and what they did was just before the last verse just before the last verse and the last verse was called the tractus that's why sometimes there is this word used tractus also for the sequence the last verse of that hallelujah uh, verse was called the tractus just before that on the last syllable of the previous uh, verse they started chanting a sequence the idea was the deacon had to carry the book of gospels from the the altar to the to the ambo and uh, they had the melismas now melisma is a rather technical word in uh, church music that is that you keep uh, dragging uh, the last syllable uh, on different notations we have this now like kyrie eleison mm -hmm. we drag on a certain note no kyrie mm -hmm. now that's a melody 
That's a melisma. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. The melismas were long in order to allow the deacon to go from this place to that place. Oh, I see. There were long melismas. So these people like Notker of Balbulus, what did they do? They said, why should we just drag on a note? Mm -hmm. Let's introduce some words into that. All right. And that's the beginning of a sequence. Okay. Right. It was called a sequence because it came after the last verse or just penultimate. Mm. Okay. After that sequence, mm -hmm. sequencia means what follows. What follows, yeah. So on the syllable they started dragging with a melisma, they introduced words. And the words were actually very interesting to study this history, were connected to the gospel acclamation, the versicle. Oh, I'll give you I'll give you uh, two examples. Now I I have this uh, in writing with me. Uh, for example, the the Alleluia verse of the Easter Sunday Mass is Christ our Paschal Lamb has been sacrificed. Let us then feast with joy in the Lord. That that is the versicle of uh, the gospel acclamation. So what did they do on the last note, the melisma? They started developing the same thing. Now, for example, the sequence of Easter Sunday begins with Christians to the Paschal victim, offer your thankful praises. Victime Pascalis is that. Yes. Right. So it's the same thing, now more developed, right? Mm -hmm. And more elaborate that we go on singing so that there is space for the deacon to move from mm. this place to that place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is the beginning of the sequences. What happened was so later. Father, that means the celebrant starts the procession of the book of the gospels as soon as the sequence starts. Yes. Right. That was the that was the beginning. Okay. Because there was the melisma. Yes. Right. Yes. And so what happens was after the melisma, there was one more verse and once again the Alleluia acclamation. Acclamation. Yeah. Right. If you notice the mm. liturgy of the Easter Sunday, Easter Saturday night, we have this problem. We have this. We have this even today. So you are wondering now, there are two Alleluias. What's, what's happening? Yeah. Which one are we going to sing? Yeah. <laughs> right? the, 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 the previous Alleluia is that of the sequence. sequence. Right? Sequence and then the second one is that of the gospel acclamation, yeah. which closed, which brought to an end the ceremonial singing of the acclamation. Mm. Right. So, but what happened was it uh, got a little exaggerated and by the time of the 14th century, 15th century, there were too many sequences, right? So much so that people began to now concentrate on the sequence. They forgot about the gospel acclamation and even about the gospel because right. the sequences are becoming very beautiful compositions, mm -hmm. very beautiful compositions. Therefore, in 1570, in the Missal of uh, Pope Pius V, they reduced that to four, only four. Okay. But then another one got added later, right? For the for the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows, another one got added later, like called the Stabat Mater mm -hmm. Dolorosa, yeah. Juxta uh, Crucem Lacrimosa Dum Pende. Which you said is a pretty long one. Yeah, that's a long one. That's yeah. a very long one. So that got added also. So anyway, there were five. But now, when you come to the uh, post Vatican II era, only two are compulsory. Okay. Only two are compulsory, namely once again on Easter, Easter. Sunday and then Pentecost Sunday. Pentecost. Easter Sunday and right. Pentecost Sunday. Okay. Of course, if there are people who are more musically inclined in, let's say, very particular communities like monasteries, they could once again pick up even a few other, a few other things like, you know, like the Our Lady of Sorrows one yeah. or Dies Irae, which is uh, on All Souls Day, right? Because some of mm -hmm. them are also found in the Liturgy of the Hours, especially for the Office of Readings. Yeah. Some of these uh, things are there. Yeah. So that's the meaning of a sequence, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure many of our lay people, my dear brothers and sisters watching from home, maybe this is all you know, new to you the word sequence, but then it is there. And then I'm thankful that you raised this issue to us so that we could at least tell them oh, what it is, especially to our lectors, mm -hmm. uh, to those who are actually preparing and organizing the liturgy of the word every Sunday in your parishes. It's important that you understand what these things are. Absolutely. Right. 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 So um, with that, we come to 
discuss the gospel acclamation, then the gospel procession, then the sequence. Remember the word tractus also is there. Tractus is the word for the last verse of uh, this gospel acclamation. And then we come to the gospel proclamation. Yes, and of course, as a gesture, everybody stands. Yes. The, imp the important part of yes. the gesture. Yes, yes. That brings me to talk about the special uh, ritual elements connected with, with the, the gospel, gospel, which are not found for the rest of the readings. Correct. For the first reading and the second reading, responsorial psalm, they are not found. But for the gospel, because it is the high point, the apex and the climax of the liturgy of the word, right? It, the gospel it goes up. It goes, the gospel the proclamation. The of yes. the liturgy of the word. Exactly. Yeah. And therefore, there are some ritual elements which must be taken very seriously as very particular and special for the gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, standing. Yeah. For the first reading, the psalm, and then the second reading, we were... Seated. seated. Suddenly we get up with yeah. the acclamation. So standing is special for the gospel. Then the procession, mm -hmm. the gospel procession, yeah. right? And within the gospel procession, the book of the gospels, there is a special book only for that. And that's why people might think, oh, you, you only for a, uh, or, or for a matter of, you know, two, three minutes, maybe five minutes. Why should you have another book? No, it's, it's because of the speciality and the uniqueness of this moment. Yeah. We said that it is an intervention by God. No, the bar yeah. is an intervention. It's the moment of intervention, divine intervention. And this is the very particular way he does that. That's why we have a special book. Mm -hmm. And that book is also, you know, the, there are covers. There are covers for the book of gospel. Some of these books we use in our parishes, my brothers and sisters are torn and dirty and yeah. you know, because maybe the books are not available. Some of these books are not in uh, <laughs> good, condition. good condition. Right? You know what I mean, especially our lectors know, right? When they go to read, sometimes some pages have gone missing yes. because the book is as old as the lector. <laughs> <laughs> I have seen in, uh, in uh, Papal Mass, I think it's in a kind of a gold-plated yes, uh, cover. Exactly. Yeah. The, the Book of Gospels is given a special honour with a cover. Yeah. Right, actually there was a time, especially uh, in the Carolingian times and also in the Middle Ages, even after the, the Council of Trent, the post tridentine period, there were, you know, gold covers with mm. precious stones. Yeah. You can see them in some of the museums if you go to mm. places like Germany and Austria and Rome. You see these uh, books, uh, the, the covers for the Book of Gospels, yeah. because they thought that it was so precious to them. Even today, it is the, it is the idea. Yeah. It is the idea. Now, when uh, Pope Francis came in 2015, I brought one from Rome. Oh, really? Right, that is still there in the Archdiocese and Liturgy Office. Mm -hmm. I personally brought the cover for the Book of Gospels from Rome. Mm. Right, because, because the due honour must be given. Yeah. The due honour must be given and then it mm. must be carried uh, with uh, due respect and honour mm. and dignity and then, then we, we place it in, on, on the ambo. Yeah. Then also insensation. Mm -hmm. Right, insensation is there and we don't yeah. incense uh, for the first reading, no. No. The second reading, no, nothing. But then we have the insensation for the, for the gospel proclamation. Mm. Then we have a special minister. We will talk about the minister. It's the deacon, right? It's yeah. the deacon. Deacon who is the ordinary minister, minister. for the proclamation of the gospel, a special mm -hmm. minister, yeah. right? All these things are, and then there is a blessing. When the deacon proclaims the gospel, he needs to get a kind of a blessing of permission. From the celebrant. From the celebrant. Yeah. He goes and bows. He goes and bows and celebrant. then, you know, so it adds to the ceremonial part yeah. of it. It's, it's a very special one. Mm. To, to read the first reading, you don't need. But, you know, in the Ambrosian mm. rite, uh, I hope it's a bit of digression. I hope you don't mind a bit of digression. I have a very <laughs> interesting uh, experience in, in Italy. I was uh, there for some time and then... Uh, I used to go to a parish close to 
the the alps mm -hmm. the northern part of uh, italy right. where they celebrate the ambrosian rite mm -hmm. not the roman rite there are little little differences in the ambrosian rite so the first time i celebrated the ambrosian rite i made a mistake i didn't realize that i was making a mistake of course i being uh, a priest of the roman rite for the first time in life uh, celebrating the the ambrosian rite what happened was i went there and then i sat down then some some lady came to read the first reading and she turned and looked at me and wouldn't start the reading <laughs> wouldn't start the right. reading i didn't realize that uh, there was something missing and then suddenly the parish priest don giovanni a very you know kind uh, italian priest he came running and said now you have to give a blessing to her okay. then only she starts right right so in the ambrosian right okay. even to begin the first, first reading, reading the priest from his seat seated has he has to give a, there is a line a prayer mm -hmm. and then only the reader begins the right. reader be so it's very special in the ambrosian right so a bit of digression but good to right. know some of these things as well and so said said that uh, we are not taken taken up that in the latin yeah, right uh, because not, it would it gives a you know a, a special Yes. A feeling for yes. me as a lector if I have to come and get <laughs> yes. your blessing yeah. before I read. Exactly. My my ministry also becomes a, a little more prominent, I mean more important and you know. Yeah. I realize that I have a very sacred role there. Exactly. You're right. Uh, the, the the Roman rite put uh, a lot of emphasis on the gospel itself only mm -hmm. they thought okay we might be diluting that kind of okay. solemnity mm -hmm. yeah. degree of solemnity yeah. by having too many blessings on the way yeah. right because you know supposing for example if i give you a nice kind of a very elaborate yes. blessing for the for the first three for, for three <laughs> day depending also on the person who is reading maybe <laughs> humanly and then a small one for the gospel who to the deacon who comes then there could be a kind of a, you know yeah. <laughs> something uh, discrepant mm -hmm. going on that's okay. why the roman right drop that but as yeah. you say rightly you know you get that feeling okay yeah. i am a chosen minister i need mm -hmm. god's blessing mm -hmm. before i do this anyway now that's why there is a special minister and a special prayer of blessing and then the kissing of the book now after after reading the first reading you don't kiss the book no yeah All right and then when the bishop is there or the holy father is there they will bless with the book yeah. and then once again another procession sometimes mm -hmm. you go and uh, in in many cathedrals they place it outside on a special lectern for people to see the gospel yeah. all that is around the gospel proclamation which mm -hmm. makes it look like the climax but unfortunately in our cases what happens is it's an anti climax so we have the beautiful chanting of the responsorial psalm it's really nice hmm. then uh, very nicely you read the second reading and the gospel acclamation is just read out so now the anti climax begins mm -hmm. then the celebrant comes very lifeless the lord be with you reading from the gospel and, and then sometimes uh, no response no response right no incense yeah. no procession mm -hmm. no book of gospels what happens is we are actually contributing towards this anti climax yeah that's why we as ministers we as celebrants must also be very conscious mm -hmm. that this is the climax and that's why it is good to chant the the opening dialogue the lord be with you yeah and then uh, proclamation of the holy gospel right and if possible the gospel to be chanted of course uh, having in mind that we must be clear about how we chant yeah the clarity of the chant is also very important supposing yeah. the chant actually undermines the clarity of the proclamation then it's another problem mm. right then the insensation then the kissing of the book right by the way after the reading of the gospel we don't raise the book right we Some don't celebrants do no we yeah. don't because it is the proclamation it is not the book, book there it is the proclamation proclamation which is live and which is you know 
uh, uh, which is now imminent, which is here in the here yeah. and now. It is God's intervention in the yeah. here and now, in the person, not in the book. We talked about that when we were talking about the theology of the word of God. Exactly. Uh, now, what, when, I, when I raise the book, Trevor, what happens yeah. is, I, I show them the book. Yeah. But here, we have to transcend the book and go to the person of Jesus Christ. And the voice of yes, Jesus Christ that was proclaimed. the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's why we ask not to raise these books. Mm -hmm. Right? We have to understand. See, in the Roman rite, there is nothing which is done without a purpose. And there is nothing which is not done without a purpose. Yeah. When we say, don't do that, it's not for the sake of a rule. Mm -hmm. It's for the sake of a special objective, special purpose. Mm -hmm. And it is deliberately done. Supposing I keep raising the book very high. Right, I am a young man, tall man, handsome man, and I raise the book, and the people are looking at the book. book. Right, no, we are, we are not go, going to ask the people to look at the book. We are asking the people to now look at the person of the Lord, the Messiah who has proclaimed. Mm -hmm. Now, Luke chapter 4, mm -hmm. right, when Jesus read that gospel, that uh, prophet Isaiah in the synagogue of his own town, right, then he, he, he uh, gives the scroll back to the attendant. And are they looking at the scroll? No, they were looking at Jesus who sat to preach. They were looking at Jesus. My dear friends, read that. Luke chapter 4. They were looking at Jesus. That's why the scroll there doesn't actually feature. Mm -hmm. It's not the scroll. It is the person, it is the proclamation, it is the intervention, it is the event, it is the dabar. Mm -hmm. That's why this is not done. That's right. why this is not done. So that's why we as celebrants also, especially our deacons, must be trained properly how to proclaim, how to chant a gospel solemnly, so that people also get the feeling, get the understanding, okay, this is the moment. This is the moment of the proclamation <laughs> of the gospel. Okay? Right. Right. Anything with regard to the gospel proclamation or we can now I proceed? think we have already come into the next part of the uh, structure that is from the gospel acclamation. Yeah. I think now we are coming to the gospel itself. Right? Gospel itself, yes. Yeah. Now that's, that's why now when we come to the discussion on the lectionary, then of course we will be talking more on the gospel uh, text itself about the yeah. text, how the texts are selected. Yeah. That is another discussion which we'll, we will come to when we discuss the lectionary. Right. But at the moment, so we will leave this at that and then go to the homily. Before that, Father, can I ask you yeah, another yeah, question? Sure, sure. One is, uh, now these readings, uh, there is also another practical uh, situation where the scripture readings, first reading, second reading and even the gospel are printed in a hymn sheet and distributed to everybody and they are reading it while the reading is being read or when the gospel is being proclaimed. Sometimes it is uh, you know, displayed on an on a LCD screen or a projector. Uh, what's your comments on that, Father? Yeah. How now we need to be um, well balanced in our approach. Now, these things were introduced for prior preparation, leaflets, yeah. pamphlets. Actually, the pamphlet for the next Sunday must be distributed this Sunday, right? So that people take it home and they are prepared mm -hmm. with the readings when they come back. Right. It is not meant for people to be reading while the proclamation is going on. Right, except in some very special cases. Supposing there is someone who is short of hearing. Right, we have this, uh, our brethren sometimes who are deaf and dumb. Mm. Maybe a person like that can read because he or she doesn't hear. Okay. Right, otherwise, Otherwise, you are supposed to be listening to the chief guest speaking. Now, supposing you are the chief guest, right? And you start your speech, the all-important speech, and there is a kind of, a, you know, an introduction <laughs> over and above your achievements, and they introduce you, then you go and speak, and then people are reading a book. How would you feel? How would you feel? Yeah. 
you feel that you know you are not welcome here you feel that they are giving you a cold shoulder yeah right they must be listening to you you are mm-hmm. speaking to them mm-hmm. it's exactly that when jesus christ the lord the messiah the master is now read now proclaiming his word people are reading something even if you have your own misal no that's not the time to go through that right. that's not the time to be looking at the led screen mm-hmm. in other words you are saying your proclamation is so hopeless and that can happen sometimes how the way we read read yeah right mm. and or there is a kind of a problem with the public in the system. system the microphone then of course you'll have yeah. to look at the led screen and yeah. say okay this must be what this man is reading yeah okay mm. that's a practical problem practical situation which must be exceptional but not the normal one yeah so normally you expect the one who proclaims the gospel to proclaim it very clearly emphatically with a lot of conviction so that you can listen to him as if you are listening to the lord himself right right yeah. that's the due respect you accord to the gospel proclamation not mm. to be reading your own text not to be looking at an led screen yeah. so that's why i said we need to give a kind of a balanced kind of an answer having in mind also that there can be few exceptions like yeah. someone who cannot hear mm-hmm. right uh maybe an exceptional exception of someone who is so poor in reading and uh microphones not working yeah. these are exceptions mm. but actually pamphlets and leaflets and missalets are important so that you can come prepared even before you come for the mass mm. and nowadays we have the bible diaries you have yeah. so many other you know through social media these things are shared by people right. the sunday gospel on saturday is available right on fb on whatsapp there are groups uh, that share these things so you can already be prepared so by the time you come to the come to the mass and uh, you are already ready mm. and uh, for the event for the intervention mm-hmm. for the experience for that you know burning of burning heart of you are already mm-hmm. prepared that's the idea so mm-hmm. these uh, leaflets and pamphlets must not be distractions during right. the proclamation during the proclamation yes okay thank you father for explaining that so very important part of uh, our understanding of yes. the liturgy of the word the struc- within the structure so the next thing uh, within the uh, ma- or the liturgy of the word if which is a very contentious part i would say is the homily as you said yeah. and uh, you know some homilies are boring some homilies are long some are disconnected from the theme and you know uh, the quality of the mass often is judged by the quality of the homily i i think yeah. if i'm right so yeah. uh, what do you think uh, father and uh, tell us what exactly should a homily do or what is its role or purpose in the mass right maybe we can pick it up once again as we begin the next one but uh, but within these few minutes i must tell you the essentials yeah the homily is an essential part an integral part of the liturgy of the word mm-hmm. there was a time especially in the middle ages when the homily was considered a disconnected part from the liturgy of the word that is why those days they began the homily with the sign of the cross they ended the homily with the sign of the cross because the homily was disconnected and thematically it had no flow from one to the other from the rest of the liturgy of the word mm. that happened especially from 1570 to 1970 when the mass was celebrated in latin and the gospel was proclaimed by the celebrant very often in latin and maybe turning the other side and people uh, didn't hear or know what he read, read. they yeah. didn't know no so what he did was after reading the the gospel he came out to the pulpit which was in the main aisle mm-hmm. if you go to some of these uh, old churches i keep telling please don't uh, 
you know, dismantle yes, these pulpits. The ones with the staircase. Yeah, and, ones with know, the staircase. Now they go and put up. flower pots there. Oh. Right? Oh. <laughs> it's, no, it's, it's a very important piece mm. of furniture which tell us about our history. Yes. About our history. And those days the gospel was proclaimed uh, on, the, on the right side of the, the altar. The mm. other readings on the left side. Mm -hmm. Hmm? They turn to the east, right, and then proclaim the gospel as if the, rise, the sun is rising from here, yes. right? And the pulpits were also prepared in many places like that. In Milan, uh, in, uh, in the church of St. Ambrose, you have one of the most uh, beautiful pulpits. Mm -hmm. If, uh, my dear brothers, if you ever go to Milan, go to that... Uh, you know, Duomo and then see this beautiful pulpit. And so the celebrant came out, he got onto the pulpit and the people turned to him because those days they, we yeah. didn't have the public address system. And he gave a kind of a, you know, a religious instruction, which uh, actually had nothing to do with the gospel proclaimed. Mm -hmm. That's why those days it was disconnected. Anyway, they gave the uh, instruction and came back. And that's why they had to start with the, in the name of the Father right. and uh, end with, the, with, the, with the, the sign of the cross. And that's why now it is called an integral part of the liturgy of the word. That's why we don't have the sign of the cross at the beginning and at the end of the homily. We mm -hmm. shouldn't do that. Yeah. Every now and then still we hear that, yeah. which is, I think, uh, ignorance of the historical development of the, of the mass. And even if that happens, I think we shouldn't take any you know, serious note of that. Yeah. Maybe that's uh, you know, some uh, uh, misunderstanding. Uh, so, it becomes an integral part. Now, let's pick up from uh, here the next time, just uh, to uh, end. Yeah. The homily must be now based on the liturgy of the word of the day, plus, if there are any liturgical, liturgical uh, implications, of a particular solemnity or a feast that we are celebrating, that can also be added. Yeah. Other than that, the homily cannot be based on other things. Right. So I cannot, in other words, talk something. No, I yeah. cannot say I'm saying something. No, certainly no. Okay, Trevor, I think it's time today. Yeah. Maybe we will pick it up once again the next time. I think uh, for the time being, Yes. We'll, uh, so we have here. this is an important part of the mass which we uh, which you said is an integral part. So we will continue with this discussion on the homily in our next uh, program, Father. Dear viewers, uh, I hope you uh, were enlightened by today's uh, explanation about uh, the gospel acclamation and the gospel, another part, most important part of the Holy Eucharist. And uh, thank you very much, Father, for enlightening us for further. And we look forward to continuing this discussion in our next episode. Dear viewers, uh, I also like to remind you before we uh, say goodbye that uh, Verbum TV is self-supported and needs your support, your uh, contributions. So please do come forward and sponsor this program. We already have received a sponsorship. Uh, for some of the programs and I'm sure there's many of you who would be willing to do so. So most welcome to contact Verbum TV and sponsor these programs and enable Verbum TV to carry on this most important evangelization through the medium. So until next time, God bless you. <laughs>